For as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow. Walk in the light, but be ready to bring the fire. Now understand, but I want you to have some understanding with the title. It's going to get clearer. But walk in the light. Live your life in Christ. But be ready when you need to bring the fire. Let's go. Walk softly, or excuse me, speak softly, and carry a big stick is a phrase or an idiom that was made famous by our 26th president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. And Teddy Roosevelt used this first when he was vice president in a speech, but then when he became president, it became more popular and it became known with his presidency. You see, it was often called, it had many names, but it was often called uh, the big stick ideology. The big stick diplomacy or the big stick policy. Speak softly, but carry a big stick. It became known as the core of his foreign policy to keep America safe. What this text actually means, what the phrase actually means when it says speak softly and carry a big stick means say what you mean you're going to say, but it literally means back it up with some action or a show of strength. Don't just talk about it. Don't just uh, bluff about it. Don't just speak things that you're not going to actually do. Don't just fantasize about it. But when the enemy comes against you or adverse circumstances come against you and you've been doing all the talking about what you're going to do, who you are, what's going to happen, don't just bluff. Teddy Roosevelt said, no, you got to make up in your mind that at that moment you're going to show your strength by pulling out your big stick. Are you with me? He showed several times in his presidency that he was not just playing. One such time was in 1902 when Great Britain and Germany actually formed or they implemented a blockade against Venezuela. And Teddy Roosevelt spoke out against their actions, told them to stop the blockade and take it down. They did not. He did not waste any time. He had already told them that he wasn't going for it. So what he did was call out the then Navy Armada called the Great White Fleet, what he had done was prepare to back up his word by building one of the strongest and deadliest navies for that time. We had it. And he sent that Navy ships down there. He sent the warships there. And he was about to use them when they backed off. He backed up what he was talking about. He did not pull them out. They saw he was ready to write. Come on, guys. What I'm trying to show you, what I want to talk about this morning, is you need to understand that this big, thick, this big stick theology, this big stick philosophy is all over the Bible. If you were to check the Bible and find out our patriarchs and matriarchs and Christians and believers, who are our forefathers, our grandmothers, our grandfathers, those who won battles, those who got their healing, those who got the supernatural peace of God, those who were attacked and continued to fight through the battle, those who never gave up, those who were in the face of odds that were overwhelming and they decided that my God was still able, those that ran up against giants, those that marched around walls, those that went into a fiery furnace, everybody you see that got a victory, they had this policy, they had been talking about who they were, they had been saying who they were, are y'all with me? They had been telling everybody who they were, but instead of just talking about it, when it was time, they pulled out their big stick and they had action and they went to fight. I need you to understand that the majority of your Christian life is going to be spent in battles. So while you're sitting around consuming the Word of God and talking about the Word of God and talking about how good God is, that's not going to cut it when it's time to go into a battle. You need to know exactly what you will do. What I'm saying is we need to understand that God expects us to speak it, but not just speak it, but talk it, not just talk it, but be ready to go against it. The downfall of most believers is that they talk about faith and they talk about faith in the safety of the sanctuary or the safety of their house. But when the real battles come, you can find them whining, you can find them complaining, I'm not talking about anybody out here. You can find them sitting around as if they had just not been touched by the power of Almighty. Come on, somebody. You did not make it this 
far by giving up. I'm trying to teach you today to quit whining about it, quit worrying about it, and make sure that you what that you speak softly and carry big stick. But today I want to change that for us. I want to put it in a more biblical understanding so you can see how this translates. Speak softly just means walk in the light. If you say you're a Christian, be a Christian. No, you can't be half a Christian sometimes, half a Christian the other time. If you say you're a Christian, the Bible says walk in the light. When we say walk in the light, we're talking about walk or live out the creeds of your faith. God said without faith it's impossible to please him. Hebrews 11 and 6. you got to learn how to walk in your faith. Without faith, you're going to perish. you got to learn that you can't say this and the enemy not hear you and life not attack you because you have to learn how to walk in the light. What's the light? The light of God's power. The light of God's word. Come on, it's all over you. Wherever you are in your house right now. The light of who God said. That light that's been protecting you. But a lot of Christians don't understand the seriousness of the commitment we have to make to even get a victory in our battles. We got to realize this is serious. You know what God said? God expects Listen to me. The average saint doesn't realize this is not just some easy salvation we're walking in. God said, there's some power I'm going to give you, but you got to learn that it takes a serious commitment to get victory. All those I was talking to, they talking about had serious commitment. Luke chapter 14, verses 26 and 27. Listen to this. When I read this, it is no misprint. Here's what God is saying. You heard it, but I want to share with you that God was serious about it. He said, if someone will come to me and is not ready to hate his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his sisters, or his brother, or is not really able to hate himself, he cannot be my disciple. Verse 27 says, and whosoever does not pick up your cross, Come on, y'all. Everybody got a cross to bear. We heard that, and it sounds cute. But all of us got some burdens we got to handle. The average person is walking around knowing that they've been through some battles, and they're in some battles. And some people are in a battle right now. All of us, God said, I don't, I don't need you talking about you love me and shouting all over that you love me and reading my word and praying. But then when it's time for the battle, you're not ready to bring the fire. Here's what God is saying. Speak softly means walk in the light. He said, ready to hate your brothers. Now, let me explain that text so you don't get it twisted. Here's what God is saying, so you don't get mixed up. Here's what God is saying. God is saying, unless you're ready to hate your wife and children, your mother, your father, your sister, all he's saying is, don't put anything ahead of me because I'm trying to save you from making an idol out of people because people will fail you and we are prone to idolatry. Come on, somebody. He said, when you put something ahead of me, you shouldn't do that because I'm trying to save your heart from you making idols or practicing idolatry. And he said, the bad thing is, once you put all your faith or your hope or you time in them, they're human like you and they're going to fail you. I got saints running around right now. You're upset because somebody failed you and you made an idol out of them. You remember in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 2 when Eli actually had two wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and it says they were priests in the temple, and Eli, who was a priest of God, knew that his sons were going into the temple, sleeping with the women, taking the meat that was supposed to be sacrificed, the sacred portion, eating the sacred portion and their portion, and they also were robbing people in the temple, and it was known all over, and Eli tried to act like he had no responsibility because he loved to put his son before God. Well, God sent a prophet to Eli in that second chapter and said, Eli, if you keep making, watch this, I, if you keep making idols out of people, a curse has come over your house and you did it. Because you put them ahead of me. Here's what the curse was. He said, now, I'm going to tell you right now, your strength is going to be cut off. And nobody in your house is going to live to old age. And your sons are going to die right in front of you as a warning that you have not tried to control them. And you put them ahead of me. And he said, they're going to die in the same day. And sure enough, wicked, hot, wicked, hot nine, and Phineas died in the same day. 
And when they died, Eli, when the uh, when the uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant was taken into the temple, he was sitting there on his seat, fell over backwards, and broke his neck. All I'm saying is when you put anything ahead of God, it's going to fail you. Samson loved Delilah more than he loved God. And watch what happened to Samson. He found himself in a bad situation because he placed something ahead of God. And when you do that, you're not ready for the real life battle. So that's walk softly, speak softly just means walk in the light. And carry a big stick. I'm going to say it this way. Bring the fire. When an enemy pushes you, let the fire of your faith answer. When trials come into your life, not tears, not fear, not doubt, let the fire of your devotion answer. Let the fire of your conviction answer. Let the fire of your love for God answer. Let there be a fire in your soul that leaps out and says, I know who I am. I know who. Hallelujah, somebody. I know who I am, and I know what my God is able to do. So I'm not going to sit here like I am. I'm trying to wake somebody. and do what God said to do. When you get those real battles in life, I'm talking about the things that try to kill you. None of that weakness is going to help you. And as I told you, the majority of your life is going to live in battles. You've got to understand who God is. Romans 12. Listen to the seriousness of the commitment again. Listen to the seriousness of the commitment. Many of us have said these scriptures. I know you're listening to me. Think you know them. You don't know them if you just sit around and get desensitized by listening to the word of God and still letting the devil zap your strength Sunday after Sunday. Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you, brother. I'm begging you by the mercies of God, God's mercy in your life, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, uh, which is your reasonable service, that you may and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, that you may know what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. God is saying, for you to be in my will, watch me take sacrifice. Maybe that's why you miss his will and his power because you won't sacrifice. You just wait and have your relationship of convenience or you supplement your relationship with God or you have a relationship with God that is based on what you can get. What am I talking about? You know what supplements are. The average saint has a supplemental relationship with God. Supplements are vitamins that you take to supplement your food. But you're supposed to make sure you eat food and the supplement is not to replace food. Here's what you do. You go all week, I don't know if it's a week, seven days, six days, eight days here or there, and then you spend one day to try to supplement your diet, but the whole time you're eating everything else out in the world. You're eating every other kind of philosophy. You're eating anything the world said, and you wonder why you can't live off those vitamins. Or you just got one of those, uh, you know, surf surface relationship with God. It's not a deep enough relationship. And the only thing going to keep you in the battle when you get where Daniel is, when you come into your own storms, your own struggles, is how deep is your relationship with God? Can you pull on the strength of God to come down now where you are? That's a question for somebody today. Can you pull that strength down to come where you are? We got to get into this text. There's so many other verses. I can show you the seriousness of our commit commitment. How about Matthew 18, 22? Peter came to Jesus and said, uh, how many times? Um, should I forgive my brother seven times? God said, no, 70 times seven in one day. We're still working on that. Um, or how about if I take you to James 1 and 2? Here's another one of those texts that we try to get desensitized. We shout off of, but do we live it? It's hard to live this text. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. Count it all joy. We don't do that. We don't, I know I haven't done it always. And there's some days I gotta force myself to do it. Count it all joy. God, this does not feel like joy. Count it all. Come on, somebody with me right now. I feel you talking to talking back to me. Even though it don't feel like joy, this is the word. Count it all joy when you fall into many diverse temptation, knowing the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you can be perfect and do what God says to. You can get to the point where you're strong enough to handle everything if you understand it takes a serious commitment. Get up. 
Get serious. You're not going to make it until you. That's why Daniel is so important. This little uh, children's Bible thing, what y'all think it is? No, there's some powerful principles in here, in this book. And that main principle that it's telling us is you got to learn how to walk in the light, right? But don't just play there in the light. When something comes, you got to learn how to bring your fire. Load up. Be ready to do what God asks you to do. And if you understand this, as the majority of Christians are going through battles, that's why you lose the battles, because you're not ready to fight. Our 10th verse is the main uh, uh, key verse to our text. Now watch what it says. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, opened up the windows of his chamber, which was pointing toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times and prayed and gave thanks unto God as he did before. Understand that process. When he knew trouble was come, he sprang into action and brought the fire. You better learn something today. I'm telling you the fire of the most devotion is how we're going to get ready. I want to give you the points of this text and I want you to follow me because there's some important things that I can do to get you out of a perplexing situation that you're in right now. I'm just talking about so somebody can understand I'm talking about something from the gospel of new edition. Uh, can you stand the rain? You know what I'm talking about. All y'all want to be fair weather Christians, but what do you do when the rain starts pouring down? Or from one of my famous, uh, one song that I love, this inspirational song, came out by Desiree, talking about what you got to be. You know what I'm on this? You got to be bad. You got to be both. The, the lyrics to the song is telling you what you got to be in order to face the trouble in your life and make a future out of your life. You got to be bad. You got to be bold. You got to be wiser. You got to be hard. You got to be tough. You got to be stronger. You got to be cool. You got to be calm. And you got to stay together. All I know is every one of those verses, everything I'm talking about, is how to survive your lion's den and how to get lion's den first. The first thing you got to do is keep trying. It's right here. Daniel's going to tell us, keep trying, keep trying to get better. Let's talk about it. The first thing I'm going to give you is a little context. This uh, chapter is letting us know that in 605 B.C., the Babylonian conquest, uh, Nebuchadnezzar II, came and he besieged Jerusalem. And after the Battle of Karmish, which was the constant Jewish and Babylonian wars, a series of fights, that all of a sudden they overcame Jerusalem, and that's when they went into the temple, took the gold, and they took some folk captive, and that's when they first took folk into exile, and Jerusalem, or the Jewish people, became the vassals of Babylon. They were paying tribute to Nebuchadnezzar. And they did this for a few years, but by 597 B.C., there was another skirmish that broke out, and that's when everybody was taken into captivity. That's when Daniel was taken, and Hananiah, and Azariah, and, and uh, uh, Azariah, and Mishael. They were all taken captive. That was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That Daniel was named Belshazzar, trying to change them into Babylonians, but they held their ground. But here in chapter 6, is a significant turning point of their captivity. You remember what happened in chapter 5? You remember uh, when Belshazzar, when he actually uh, went into the temple and took those, got those golden uh, cups from the temple of God and decided to have a party and he sat with his prostitutes and they had this party and he sat there and God was angry and God's hand came out, no arm, no body, just a hand and was writing on the wall when God got angry and that night Belshazzar actually died and the Medo-Persian Empire under King Darius was now in control and the Babylonians were gone and here Daniel who had been third in command of the Babylonians and a counselor to Nebuchadnezzar and to Belshazzar was now a counselor to Darius. How did he do it? That takes us to my first point for you to understand our background why you got to keep trying to give God your best. Here's what Daniel said. I was taken when I was 19 years old, maybe 20 it was 65 years later. So Daniel said, I am now uh, 83 years old. And he said, at least 83 years old. And he said, God has been faithful to me. And he said, God has helped me come from being a slave to being third in, in control of Nebuchadnezzar and Babylonians. And now Darius has looked and saw my qualities. And now Darius has made me one of his rulers. You get that? God will preserve you and prosper you. And 
and give you favor. Here's what I'm saying. Bad things kept happening to Daniel. Bad things that he could have fell apart with. He could have found himself down saying, I don't know why I'm like this. When bad things happened, Daniel didn't do that. He said, look how God has preserved me. Look at the favor God gave me. Yep, yeah, it was bad. Somebody died. Yep, yeah, it was bad. I got a divorce. Yep, yeah, it was bad. I'm sick and I'm on medication. Yep. Yeah, and gave you favor. So Daniel, in this text, was trying to keep on getting God's best. The first three verses tell us why. It says that Nebuchadnezzar, um, excuse me, that Darius, King Darius of the Persians, had put 120 satraps over his princes, over all of the work, the region of the kingdom, so that he would not have to worry about the kingdom being taken care of. Then he put three counselors over them, or three presidents, your text may say. And those three presidents they put over them, Daniel happened to be one of them. And he put them because he found out that they were there was bribery and there was uh, there were there were thieves in the kingdom. There was most of the men that rose up, the princes and those in control, except for Daniel. They were going around trying to get stuff for themselves. They were stealing from the king. They were taking bribes from the people. And so he had to set these three over because he couldn't watch the whole kingdom over the 120 princes. And then they found out something. Daniel was a snitch. Daniel was an honest man. Daniel happened to make sure he kept the books right. Daniel, he wasn't trying to tell them both, but he made sure everything was reported. And you know what a thief does when that started happening? They want to get rid of Daniel. And it said the king noticed that out of everybody in his kingdom, Darius noticed that Daniel could be trusted because he had an excellent spirit. All I'm saying is those of you that keep trying to give God your best, you're the one that God loves. You're the one God's trying to uh, bless you because you have an excellent spirit. What does excellent mean? It doesn't mean a perfect spirit. You know what it means? It means like the rest of us, you fall down, but you're going to get back up. It means like the rest of us, God said, they may do something bad. They may say something wrong. They may go out the way, but you better believe. They better. Come in, anybody know what excellent spirit is? Tell somebody I got one. God No, sometimes you cuss. No, sometimes you mess up. Yeah, sometimes you do the wrong thing. That's just say cuss. I'm, I'm sorry. But sometimes you do it. All I'm saying is what you do, though, when that stuff happens, you better believe you clean that stuff up and you keep running back to God and you tell everybody, don't try to give my seat away on Sunday because if I sin Saturday night, you better believe I'm still pressing my way to get. Anybody know what I'm talking about? There have been some days when I knew that I had to run back to God. All God is saying, I'm looking for people that's trying to keep doing their best. Peter is a great example because some of us know that we're just like Peter. What did Peter do? Peter said the wrong thing. Peter did the wrong thing. But at the end of the day, God said, I can trust Peter because he takes ownership. And on the day of Pentecost, 5,000 people were saved by Peter. Yeah, the one who cussed at the cross. I know what I was saying when I say cuss. The one who disowned God. I know some of us who are called ourselves holy have done that. I know some of us who have stepped out. Come on, somebody, be honest with me. But we step back in and said, no, there's nothing as good as God. Here's what God means by excellent spirit. When I hurt God, I hurt. You know what I'm talking about? Some people can do something against God or against his word and keep on trucking. They forgot that they did. That's not me. I'm the kind of person that I reverence God, I trust God, and every time I lie, I cry. Every time I sin, I try to find a way to, to, to get back in with God. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what it means? That you've done something and then you're scared? Or, or you have been sitting somewhere and I remember one day I was sitting down and the sky got weird. You know, and stuff started crackling, and it got real dark, like abnormally. And I'm thinking, the rapture, you know, is the rapture coming? And, I, you know, I had just done something, and I'm sitting around checking to make sure I'm gone. And I said out loud, God, if anybody's going to take me. Now, I've been saying 25 years, but I had sinned, and so that was, I was too scared. See, some of y'all just act like you can serve God any kind of way. I wanted to make sure if the rapture happened, I want to be going too. But I made, and you may sound funny, 
but I wanted to make sure that if I did something bad, I would get back. What do I mean? If I hurt God, it, it, if I hurt God, it hurts me. Some people aren't like that. Uh, you can treat people bad, it don't bother you. You can say anything you want to somebody and still come to church and just shout all over the place. I can't do that. God said, when you find out that it's hurting God, when you're a person with an excellent spirit, you try to fix that thing up. And secondly, when God hurts you or looks like he's hurting you, it does not separate you from God. What am I saying? As soon as some people don't get what they think, I'm talking to somebody, let me tune in right over here. Somebody get what they think they should not, don't get what you think you should have got. Or you start questioning God or, or second guessing God, why? Nothing wrong with that, but don't let it stop you from getting back closer to God. A person with an excellent spirit realizes something. God has been too good. I can't let one little thing mess me up when there's been so many other things that God has given me that has blessed my life. Can I get somebody to praise God out there? I know you might be mad about one thing right now, but can you praise him for all the things that he has done that you never said anything about? But a person with an excellent spirit is constantly trying to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, uh, when I break up with a friend... I'm going to tell you what it means. Uh, the reason I can't break up with God, you ever seen kind of people, they've been lifelong friends, and they break up with a friend, and they say to themselves, I'm not never going to talk to that person again. And maybe you might say that, but your heart is such that even sometimes, and, and, and they deserve it. They deserve what you were saying. They had done something. But your heart is still missing that fellowship, missing that reconciliation. And you, you don't want to say it, but a person with excellent spirits, I got the makeup, I got to find a way because I still yearn for them. If you got a hard heart, you don't. You just sit there and say, I ain't never going to do it. And that's how we do. We walk away from some things that could bless our life. Now, the reason you have to make sure you keep trying to do what's good and do what's right, because right here in the text, verse 4 and 5, it tells us that they got angry because the king said, I'm getting ready, in the end of verse 3, to maybe set Daniel over the whole kingdom. He said, it's going to be me, then Daniel, then the other two people, then the 127. So he said, I'm going to change the, the, the structure, the flow chart here. And they said, uh-uh, we do not want that honest man over us. And they started plot. The first thing I need you to know why you got to keep doing your best, because the enemy will come after you. There's going to be an attack. It's inevitable. Please listen to me. First thing the enemy does is lie on you. Have you been in church and then thought it was strange? Maybe you cried when it first happened, but have you seen folks, they just lie on you for no reason? Uh, they lie about what, and, and, and the bad thing is they just don't lie on you. They go to ruin your reputation by lying on, I'm, I'm preaching right now, stay with me, to somebody else. And you know the lie ain't true and you don't want to scream out, but they lie. But here's what I found out over the years. The reason people lie like that is because they're putting on you the quality of life they're living and they're angry or jealous that you're trying to live above that. So what they put on you is what they would do if they were you. So they go around saying, he got to be doing something. He got, I remember, I remember I was passing this blew me away. Uh, I, and some people out there, I hope you're not watching me today because you might be one of the ones that said it. He running women. And uh, uh, he run around and look at it. Yeah, stealing money from the church. Yeah, he ain't no good. That's all they do is just make up stuff because of the anger. Because the enemy has to come and use somebody. I remember on the anniversary, the church leased a car because me and Marsha needed a car. Our kids were young. We were just coming down to church. Our vehicles were reliable. Church said, for your anniversary, we're going to lease a car. The car belonged to the church. But so many folks were so worried about the car, they started going around. Look at it. They done bought him a car, and I heard they gave him over $10,000. That a shame, shame, shame what he's doing in that church. I wish I had $10,000. I will tell you right now, my church takes good care of me. But you know what? That church, that car was leased to the church. I like to throw this in because some people still like to talk. I worked all my life. I was working here and working somewhere else. I would have called Tim Maker, but that don't stop them from lying on you. And here's the bad thing about a lie. It won't come to pass. Not only will they lie on you, it got worse. They couldn't find a fault. Ooh, when they can't find a fault, the devil says, now go do the offering. Look at verse 5. When they couldn't find a fault, the devil made them sit around and say, the only place we're going to make a fault is with his God. Watch out. 
Now the devil's going to try to put uh, something on you that separates you from your testimony. Ooh, stay with me. They're going to say something. They're going to, they got no evidence, no proof, but they say anything. So what he does is set up something, set a trap to see if you will fall in it. They'll put you in a position. I'm just telling you, watch out. Because what they will do, what the enemy will do, he'll use somebody. You know, uh, you haven't fornicated in a while. And the devil said, look, I had them when they were fornicating. I need to set another trap. So what they did, they went to King Darius and said, Darius, I need you to make a decree that for 30 days, nobody is to worship anybody but you for 30 days. All they were saying is this was something that was done in biblical times. A lot of the kings were thought about being uh, gods, you know, and Egypt. They thought they were gods. So, that's, you know, so King Darius said, whoa, not Nebuchadnezzar, King Darius. King Darius said, whoa, that's good. So let's do that. So they, they, they put the decree out. They had trouble in the first, but then he signed it. He didn't realize that they were setting up the council. He like, all of a sudden, he found himself in a position where either he had to stop worshiping God or he had to get thrown in lines. Then all I'm telling you is this. If you haven't fornicated in a while and you made up your mind and you've been walking with strength, haven't gotten high in a while, haven't went out and wowed out in a while, you've been doing what's right, you better believe that and that enemy will set a trap for you. Here comes the one woman. You had not seen her out of nowhere. Here comes the one man you ain't seen out of nowhere. They'll call you up. Uh, I, I, I was just thinking about you, baby. And they will do something because they're your kryptonite. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I'm talking about uh, C's, uh, uh, what's this girl name? Susie Big Hips and, and, and Johnny Long Legs. They'll come along because they know they can get you and the enemy is waiting. Let him fall. Let him fall. Let him fall. Sounds funny, huh? But a lot of us fall because they come along and the enemy wants to set that trap. Second point to this text is look what Daniel did. Verse 9 and 10. Verse 6, 7, and 8 just talks about what they did with Darius. But verse 9 and 10 says, Keep doing what is faith building. The first point is keep doing your best. The second point is keep doing what is faith building. Follow me. Many people will tell you keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing in bad times that you were doing in good times. No, I don't go for that. Because keep doing what you were doing in bad times you were doing in good times. Because some people aren't doing anything in good times. So what I tell people, don't do that. Keep doing what was faith building. And a lot of times what was faith building is not what you were doing in good times. It's what you did in bad times. Somebody say amen. You know it's when the bottom fell out. You know it's when you got sick. You know it's when trouble came. You know when your money got funny. You know when your mind was going crazy. That's when you got on your knees and you prayed the hardest. And you praised God the hardest. And you trusted God. You did that to get out of your situation. I'm saying instead of just trying to do that to get out of your situation, that's what you got to do. Keep building your faith consistently. What Daniel did when it says keep doing They came out against Daniel, and he didn't sit down. He didn't even hesitate. He did not stumble. Daniel brought the fire. All I'm saying is keep doing and keep building what builds your faith. I remember um, I, I had a quick temper. <laughs> uh, I had. I still got to control it, but I had a quick temper. I remember uh, some things that would make me mad if my wife didn't clean the car. I know she listened to me. So what happened is I, I would go out there. I learned. I learned. She'll tell you I learned. I used to go out and harp. Look at that dirty car. I walk out to the car. As soon as I see the dirt, something's veins. I, I'm man. Then I look in the back seat. Oh my God. And all of a sudden the devil talking to me. You know she couldn't clean that car. Look at you're not car. You paying this car. Right? Man, by the time I got into the house with her, I had the veins at my neck. I was howling her. I said, hey, look. And all of a sudden, she walked right away from me. House all tore up. Ain't nobody talking to nobody. We all messed up. Then I feel bad because I hollered. It was all out of character. So I have to go repent. So what I learned now, if I go out there, car dirty, I will go wash the car. And when, when she comes back, she just says, thank you, honey. Car looks so good. And I say, yeah, honey, when you, you go in town, you know, just wash it. She says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to wash it when, I, when I, I get over there. And, and she do sometimes. And she do. But what I'm telling you is the difference is I learned how to do it God's way so there would be no trouble in my house. And look what Daniel did. This is what messed me up. Verse 10. Listen. Tell you how he brought the fire. And when he knew the writing was signed. 
Soon as he knew it, it was like that's when Daniel went to his house, opened up the windows. Do y'all hear me? This is how you bring your fire. Fire your devotion. Fire your love for God. Fire your faith. Then he opened his windows, nailed down, pointed to the room, prayed three times, and thank God just like he did before. What I'm trying to tell you is Daniel had the response that we should have. Instead of us getting fearful when the enemy comes, we ought to be telling the enemy, how dare you? We ought to be telling the enemy, you must go know who you're messing with. We ought to tell the enemy, you should have left me alone. You ever heard that phrase, poke the bear? Poke the bear is a popular term that meant that when the bear is sleeping, don't poke the bear. All you're going to do is wake him up and make him come after you. You better leave well enough alone. So tell the devil, whenever you attack me, all you did was poke the bear, and I'm getting ready to get on my knees. I'm getting ready to fast. I'm getting ready to pray. I'm getting ready to shout. I'm getting ready to have joy. Because I realize who I belong to and what God is able to do. Let me give you an example. If you ever watched The Last Dance, talking about the dynasty of the Bulls, right, and their six championships. Well, in 1995, uh, right after Michael Jordan had just come back, and they were pursuing their, uh, you know, fourth championship. He had just come back off of his, you know, little time out where he's playing baseball. And when he got back, he was still Air Jordan. But some folk had a nerve to try to pick at him. First of all, I just want to pull this one in. In 1997, when Carl Malone got the MVP and he was mad, he messed them up in that series. That's how they won that series. They should have left Michael Jordan alone. But the one I want to tell you about is in uh, November of 1995, they were playing the struggling Van Vancouver, uh, what were Vancouver called back in the days? I didn't write it. Grizzlies, the Grizzlies. They were playing the Vancouver Grizzlies. And Derek Mark, you might not remember him, he was a 5'11 point guard who was in his sophomore year. And he talked about this in the last dance. He talked about, you don't ever, you, you don't ever insult Michael Jordan, but he made a mistake. The Bulls were predicted to win that game, but now there was three minutes left, and the Grizzlies are up by nine, and he walked past the bench. Michael Jordan sat on the bench, took the socks off. You know, this was, this was the last game of the road trip. They were going back home. They were thinking about getting back home. Till he poked the bear. He looked over there. I told him we were going to beat y'all. Phil Jackson knew it. Phil Jackson looked down the bench and said, hey, what you want to do? All of a sudden, Mike bent down, tied his shoes. Let me, let me let Derek Martin tell you what he said. Michael Jordan did. Michael Jordan bent down, tied his shoes, walked on the court and said, hey, little man, I told you about trash talking me, didn't you? And he said, Mark said, he said, well, there's three minutes left. We're going to beat y'all today. Michael Jordan went out and comm commenced to scoring 15 points in the last three minutes to win the game. And the last shot he made, he looked over for the bench trying to find Mark. It was almost like he was trying to tell you, don't pull up the bear. Some of y'all, instead of backing up, instead of getting quiet, instead of crying, instead of, come on, how many times has God brought you through? Instead of sitting there like you don't know, you ought to tell the devil, don't pull up the bear. You should leave me alone, leave good enough alone, because as soon as you touch me, I'm getting ready to do something that you ain't going to like. And that's when you have your attitude to make sure you understand. Daniel in his prayer. I gotta hurry. I gotta hurry. Daniel in his prayer. Watch this. I like Daniel. You can tell his attitude from his prayer. Because the prayer said he gave thanks unto God. Wait a minute. That, that can't be right. I mean, he had been serving God faithfully 65 years, and all of a sudden now he's going to the lion's den. Why would he whine? Why would he cry? Why would he complain? Because the Bible said he pulled out the weapon of thanksgiving unto God. He was bringing the real fire. You want to know what the greatest weapon is that you can bring? It's a praise of thanksgiving that does not make any sense to the average mind, but makes sense to you because you realize who it is that you're thinking. It's letting God know, Lord, I'm grateful. If you don't do nothing else, I'm not going to let this period right here mess up me with all the stuff you've done in my life. I'm going to make sure that I remember and give you glory for all the things you already got me out of. I'm trying to help somebody right now. Instead of you sitting there in that down, sour, messed up state, I dare you to rise up and remember what God God has already done in your life and tell God, I thank you. Thank you for what? Man, you can't think of enough things to thank God for because he's done too many for your words to even conceive. God has done so much I can't even put it in 
words. The psalmist says that my tongue can't speak enough words. If I spoke thousands of words, it could not be enough words to thank God for what he's done in my life. Some of you can't get your blessing because you don't thank God enough. There was this man sitting at the dinner table, and his pattern was every time his wife put food on the table, he would grumble about the food, grumble about her cooking, grumble about what she did. But then when everybody sat down, he would pray and give thanks. Well, his daughter watched this for a while, and she got inquisitive. She said, Dad, um, does, does God hear us when we pray? And Dad said, yes. He was all proud that he has got his daughter interested in God. He was saying, he, he said, he said, well, does God hear us other times, hear all the other stuff we say? He said, yes. And then he started thinking, wow, right, I got my daughter thinking about theological things. And all of a sudden, his daughter said something that embarrassed and stopped his soul. He said, well, Dad, tell me something. Which one does God believe? Wow. Uh, maybe you blame something on God. It's your fault. God don't know which. You grumble him, and then you praise him. Which one's true? You grumble, but then you pray. God said, God can't figure out which part of you. He said, a double-minded man will get nothing. Let's go. Last point. Keep on doing what's best. Keep on doing what's faith building. But finally, keep on believing for a prosperous future, even going into the lion's den. Keep believing for a prosperous future. Look what happened. Lions. I got to put this out first because some of y'all think this was some kind of fail or something. But I need you to understand, I did some little, no, I listened to a, a, a tape on lions. Here's what lions, they said. Just some characteristics of lions. First, lions are the most fierce animal in the jungle. They can grow, the male lion with the big mane can grow up to 400 pounds. He can run 50 miles an hour when chasing his prey. He can tackle a wildebeest. He can tackle any beast in the jungle. His roar is a sound that puts fear in people's hearts because he wants to intimidate you so he can come over and attack you. A lion must eat about 17 pounds of food a day. So most of the time, the lion's mind is on food. Lions were prevalent in the deserts around Jerusalem in the deserts biblical time because contrary to belief, lions don't hang in the jungle. They hang in the grassy plains areas. That's where they're there with their pride. And that's where they're taking care of their cubs. That's where the lions and so when a lion, when you ran into a hungry lion, it was almost curtains or anybody. But Daniel still believed he had a future with his lion. Come on, I can't preach this fast enough. Somebody ought to know. Just because the doctor said, the doctor says it's a death wish, don't believe it. God got the power. Just because somebody told you it's not going to work, don't believe it. God still got the power. You got to believe. If nobody else gets delivered, I still got Bible says all those hungry lions, Daniel survived. How did he survive? It's because Daniel before he got to the lion's den had already been walking in the light. Daniel before he got to the lion's den had had some experience and years with God and walked with God for 65 years in a foreign land. He saw many times he was about to die and God delivered him. So the first thing you need to have is a spiritual mind an earthly mind will be fearful at this time. An earthly mind will cry at this time. But a spiritual mind will look at God and believe that there's still a window of hope. I'm never hopeless as long as I got God. Somebody hear me? A spiritual mind is a made up mind that no matter what happens, God is still in control. Daniel, first of all, he had to set his mind to believe. Oh, I'm helping somebody right now. Set your mind. Don't look at what the enemy's saying. Don't look at that other stuff pouring into your mind. Set your mind a spiritual mindset. I made that word up. Let me tell you what it means. Spiritual mindset is a spiritual mindset. A spiritual mindset is a righteous indignation at the enemy attacking you, your family, or your stuff. That's what happened to Jesus when he went to the temple and he threw out the money changers. He was angry. He was. They would have said he was mean. You got to get a mean set at that moment. You got to get so mad. It's almost like you ever played dozens. You know what I mean? You got to get just as a, a defensive of God as you would if somebody talked about your mama. Come on, you got that one, baby. Your mama, that fighting words right there. Well, as soon as the enemy says, your God ain't it, well, that's when you ought to get mean and start standing 
And finally, you've got to have a spiritual memory, a spiritual mindset, a spiritual mindset, a spiritual memory. I believe Daniel, in those midnight hours when the lions were sitting there, probably confused themselves because they didn't attack him, but God held him at bay. His mind was thinking, how great is our God? Sing with me how great. I believe Daniel was singing songs and hymns, and I believe the lions were just sitting there. And wonder why couldn't they move? But when God has your preservation, there's nothing the enemy can do about it. Let's close. Next day, the king ran out, didn't sleep all night. You got to live so your enemies even worried about you. You know, there's some people out there laugh at you, but because you have Jesus, as soon as something happens in your life, you're the first person they run to. And so the king reached the next morning and said, Daniel, did your God save you? And Daniel said, Yes, he did. And all of a sudden, he told him how God sent angels. We like that part, but I don't want you to get that part. I want you to see what God was aiming at, what Daniel knew. The Bible said, then the king, after throwing in those other folks, the king put out a decree. I want to read this to you. It said, that every nation, I make a decree that every dominion of my kingdom, that men tremble in fear at the God of Daniel. For he's a living God, the steadfast God. That the kingdom which he has cannot be destroyed. His dominion is from the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven. He has delivered Daniel from the power of the lion. Did you see what happened? When you have a mindset to realize that I can walk in the light of God. As soon as trouble comes, I can spring up and bring the fire. All of a sudden, you'll get the result that God was looking for. You'll have other people looking at you, shaking their head. Talking about they don't know how.